Good morning. Today's scripture is Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. This is the word of the Lord. Good morning. How many of you love job interviews? Anybody? Nobody. Not one person. One kidding, I think. Not one person loves job interviews. I was thinking back this week to my first job interview, my first real one. I had several jobs with my dad and my grandfather before I had to go get a real job that I had to get. And I remember going to this interview, and I think the worst part of interviews is the question, where do you see yourself in five years? Like, I think that's the worst part of an interview. And in and, and, and that time, it wasn't like sort of common knowledge, or at least it wasn't to me. And so when that question was asked in my first interview, I was like, I, I don't know where I'm going after I leave here. Like, uh, it certainly isn't at this job. This job is terrible, and I just need it for a minute. Um, so that would have been my answer. I don't remember what I answered, but I remember sort of making a pact saying like, if I ever get into the position where I'm interviewing people, I'm never going to ask people that question. Like, I'm just, I'm never going to ask them that. And then fast forward several years to where I was a manager in a company that we were trying to revitalize the company. And there's no better way to revitalize a company than through better hiring practices. And I remember just being faced with, hey, it's my job to put the right people on the bus and just wanting to ask that question, that, that question of longevity, of vision. Do they have a purpose? Like uh, that type of thing. And, and, and just being so tempted to do that. Uh, I found other ways to do it. Um, but here's the thing, almost no one has a real answer for that. Almost no one has a real answer for the question of, where do you see yourself in five years? And, and I think the, the reason why is that not because people don't have an imagination, it's not because people are bad at goal plan, goals and, and, and planning and, and, and those types of things or that they don't have aspirations in life. The reason that it's hard for most people is because very few people are in possession of the purpose of their lives. Just let that sink in for a minute. Most people... This is a hard question because very few people are in possession of the purpose of their lives. Now, if you're me like me and I'm sitting there and I'm listening to me say that, I'm, I'm sort of like starting to wonder, well, what does he mean by purpose? Do I have that? You're reflecting. Am I on that? Right. So let me let me just sort of define what I mean by this purpose that we're talking about this morning. Meaning that through mentorship, through, through discipleship, through the wisdom of friends and family, and through trial and error, and through many experiences, they find a path, a path that's usually connected to the past and leads them to a certain future. Okay, that's what I mean by purpose, right? I'm not talking about wild ideas or egotistical fantasies about what you're capable of or you should be doing. Like, like that's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about a very sophisticated and a very mature idea of calling and of purpose in life. That's what we're, we're talking about this morning. And many of you are on that journey. You're on that journey today. And and, and, and you know what you're good at, like you're, you're finding those things out in life. And some of you have been around a while. Maybe you've actually already been through this purpose journey and you've had a career and, and you've enjoyed that. And, and maybe things are different now and you're trying to figure out your calling in a new season. 
And then there's some that are just sort of trial and error basis. And you're just like, you're, you're younger and you're like, I think this is it. Let me try this. Hopefully you're listening to the, to the, to the wisdom that God puts around you. And you're, and you're sort of trying to feel your way through like, who am I? How has God made me? How's he gifted me? Where am I heading? That type of thing. And then other, others of you are just like, I, I don't know. I don't know. Um, I'm doing what I need to do. I'm doing what I have to do, or I'm doing what the Bible commands me to do. I, I don't know about this purpose thing, so maybe this is sort of a new conversation. In this season of, of King's Cross Church, where, where we've been talking about this Greek word, oxano, my wife would be very happy to hear me say oxano. I guess I've said exano a few times, and she's like, hey, you need to say that right. And I was like, great. You're a grammar Nazi in Greek as well as English. So, oxano. Oxano is this Greek word for spiritual growth that we see in the New Testament. And, and, and this morning, I just want to share one simple, beautiful verse that answers some of the biggest questions in regards to how do we grow? How do we spiritually grow? Not just like, how does your brain think better? Or your hands do better, right? How does your spirit, your soul grow in the idea of God's calling and his purpose for you in life? Like that's what we're after this morning. That's what we're trying to do. And I think that this passage that we heard this morning is the foundation of calling and purpose. It's the very foundation of it. So whatever you build and whatever you perceive and however you leave here and make sense of it, I'm hoping that just this would be a solid foundation for you to do that with. And I would argue that if you don't build on this foundation, you're always going to be missing something in your journey. You're always going to be missing something. So let's pray before we jump in. Father, we, we love you. We are so thankful this morning to, to be gathered here by you. And even just this morning in worship, just feeling like refreshment that I, when I walked into the room, Lord, like I didn't even know that I needed that. And, and I, was, I was singing and I just felt this, this wave of, of refreshment and encouragement that, that my soul needed. God, you knew I needed that and I didn't even know that I needed that. And so we believe, Lord, that you will continue to give your children good gifts this morning. Like, I pray for this idea of purpose that we could receive it. Like, I don't know, um, Lord, I think that I'm just so prone sometimes to be idle. I'm so prone to, 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 to um, go through the motions in life. I'm some, like, I'm somehow disconnected from the true reality of your kingdom. I'm tempted to believe that what I do doesn't matter as much as that more important person that you're clearly working through. Like my, my life somehow trapped in the bullpen and the outfield never to be called out. Lord, I, I pray that you would save us from the delusion of a lack of significance. If, if you just pull us up out of that this morning, God, I would be so thankful. From the temptation this morning to believe what we do doesn't matter, would you breathe new life into this gathered church? Anyone listening online this morning or in the future, Lord, would you cause this super abundant growth? Help us grow. Make us grow. Cause us to grow. And Lord, help me to honor you with what I say and with every feeling and reflection of my heart. May they be pleasing to you, O oh God. And all God's children said, amen. So the past two weeks, just a quick reminder is if you haven't heard those sermons, we want to just push you to go back, inspire you to go back, to listen to those. We think they're really, really important for this season. Week one, we set up the basis of this idea of spiritual growth and growing together, which we believe is our sort of seasonal vision that lays under our, our wider vision we call Oxano. And it comes from 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 3, that says, We ought always to give thanks to God for you, brothers, as is right. 
because your faith is growing abundantly. It's the only time to, that this word in the Greek is coupled with another word, hooper, which means super or abundant type of growth. It's the only time that this word that Jesus and the apostles used for true spiritual growth is coupled to, to, to unleash on this church to say, like, I want super abundant growth, like abundant life for, for you as Christians. And so we're, we're praying, as Paul wrote this to that church, we're praying for that for us. That's our prayer, that God would do what God does with Christians. And that he would do that in an exponential way. That's what we're, we're praying that, that, that Lord, the Lord will grow us up, that he will make us sharper, that he would make us more fervent in worship in awe of him. He'd make us like better at relationships and loving one another and serving one another and being in community. And he'd make us better on his mission. And so today we're asking that God would stir up the gifts of the body. We're asking that he would stir our gifts up and awaken us to who he's made us to be in our whole lives. That's what we're praying for. So let's look at our passage together. Ephesians chapter 2. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in, walk in them. There's three things that we can take from that. Just the three sections. One is that God created you for a purpose. He created you for for a purpose. He created you on purpose. He created you with a purpose. There, there's so much in the, just this one verse about God's plan for you. There's, there's so much focus that God shines down towards you. God created you on purpose for we are his workmanship. We are his workmanship. If you have low self-esteem, this is the cure. It's not somebody else to sort of puff you up because that won't sustain you. Like what you really need at the foundation of your being is that you are the handiwork of God. You're his handiwork. The work of his hands. And, 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 and that's true for every human being in, in the world. But Paul's focus right here is on the new creation that, yeah, God created us humanity, but in the new creation, Christian, like you're his handiwork. It's, it's, a, it's a beautiful Greek word, poema, which means a poem or poetry. I, I just want you to wrap your mind around this, that God has, has he created you? Yes, but he, has re, he is recreating you in his image. Sin fractured humanity. At the deepest levels, it broke us. And in the gospel of Jesus, he frees us and he recreates us and we are his masterpiece. You, you have to believe this. Paul's argument is that we as God's children are his masterpiece. We're not downtrodden people, but we are bright, shining lights. We are, we are a force to not be hidden, but to be reckoned with. Like that's Paul's vision here for us. And yet there are insecurities that are harboring inside of us, always pushing against that. And God's word pushes back and says, you're his masterpiece. He created you. You're his workmanship. He created you in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. God knitted knitted you together in your mother's womb, David said. That was the place that God knew you. And you're the only you on earth. You're the only you on earth. Psalm 139, 14 says, I praise you. I praise you for I'm fearfully and wonderfully made. Wonderful are your works. My soul knows it. 
very well. The Christian should have that song emanating from the revelation that God has done his best work in you by making you and by saving you and by freeing you and by showering your life with his grace. We're talking about Jesus' creation, his resurrection power flowing through you. We are absolutely the result of God's productive, redemptive, and sanctifying work. We are his handiwork created by God, for God, and in God. The Christian's new life in Christ is so loaded with creative purpose and power. And God's oxano, or growing us up, is to prepare us for his action in the world. And in the eschatological push towards the day of glory. It's not just you that he's doting. There's so much more beauty and purpose that we're a part of. We're his workmanship and we have to know it, believe it, see it, lay hold of it, fight for it, remind one another of it. But this is what the gospel has done. It's freed you, it's made you his own, it's made us be able to call him father. We are adopted into his family, it's what that means. We are his workmanship, created on purpose. Created on purpose. Number two, you were created, you were created by God for a purpose. So he meant to make you, he loved to make you and save you and he had a purpose. You're created in Christ Jesus for good works. That's your purpose. If you're a believer, our purpose is good works. Did you know that? Did you know it? That, that that's the purpose God saved you? He saved you because of his, his, his love and his mercy. But, but like that salvation and the purpose is for you to do good works. You know, we get calling sometimes really confused in, in the church, right? Like we get caught the word calling confused. Like we use it most of the time to talk about a person's calling to vocational ministry or maybe to uh, be a missionary. Like those are the two sort of ways in which, you know, it's something like, oh, I feel called to, to go all in, right? Like that's how we, we use the word, but that's really not that biblical in the sense of like what calling is in scripture and throughout history is that, that the church has a calling. So, so that calling is, is your good works, right? Like there's this way in which that calling is, is your good works and there's a uniqueness to how you do that. And, and so your calling and my calling are the same as Christians, but there's a unique way in which we both pursue that. At a macro level, our calling to good works is the same for every Christian. Love your neighbor, be hospitable, feed the hungry, clothe the naked, build up the body of Christ. Live on God's redemptive mission. Take care of your family. Take care of orphans. Take care of widows. We could go on and on. There's so many demands of scripture of like, this is our calling as Christians. This is how we live. This is the Christian life played out all the one another's in scripture that we are to be to one another. There's so much there. We all are called to be that kind of light. To, 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 to sort of like reflect our savior through the transformation of our inner being and, and to, to behave at, and like that. That's our calling. 
And we should be excited about those things. We should be pursuing those things and we should be prioritizing those things. The problem is there's so many of them. Like just in the few minutes that I have a pulpit, I have about 60 priorities here to be faithful to the Bible and to be good for you. Right? Like you're just juggling all of those things in once. And our whole life contains so much. Thank God you have the Spirit of God to sort you out, to help you, to day by day help you pursue that calling and to do it well and to live well under God's grace. And yet there's a way in which you, as a finite, limited time, Limited energy, limited gifts, limited resources that you do your specific part. There's, there's a way that you do. We can't, you know, Ephesians, Corinthians, we can't all do what we want to do, maybe. Like, I really want to lead worship. Trevor won't let me. He's like, it's been 30 years since you've done that. Who knows what'll come out? That's not my part. That's not my part. What part is yours? That's just a big question. You can put that into whatever container you want. In your home, at your job, in your your hobbies, in your friendship group, in, in one relationship, in the church. What's your part? And how do you know that? How are you wired? How are you wired? God's created you for good works. There's a way in which we all do that together, biblically clear commands. There's a way that you've been made. There's been a way that you've been made. God wired you. And everyone's not a hand and everyone's not a foot. There's a way that God's made you. This is biblical doctrine, like that, that we are made differently and he has proportioned gifts and measures of gifts to us. There's a way in which your purpose is playing out in this world. I want you to be aware of that. Be aware of how that is happening. The journey of discovery after encountering Christ. And even Paul turned to others as he he saw the risen Jesus and he turned to others to help him sort of figure that out. And he spent years trying to pursue and work out his calling before he became super Paul. Like he spent a long time. And so it's a journey to discovery. It's not a lone affair. It's something that you have to embrace, though, and it's something that you have to invite. Discerning your purpose is not a lone affair, and many are so afraid of opening up what they feel called to in life because it's easier to keep on doing the same thing every day, and it's scary to maybe embrace some of those things that you might see. For many... We've gotten so used to playing it small in life that you never ever ask the question, what does God have for me? What does God have for me in this new season? So I want to invite you this morning to ask that. Uh, I'll just give you some wise advice too is like, hey, my ultimate calling, even like if you think of specifically, it's not to be a pastor or preacher. I just want to give you a little bit of advice here. Like, it's not to be a pastor or a preacher. That's not my, that's not my calling. It's how we talk about it, maybe. You know, like, one day you will be present with the chief shepherd and the living word. I'm out of a job here in a minute, right? <laughs> so I've been, like, learning to cook real good, learning to play my guitar better. I... You know, that's what I'll be doing in eternity. Like, don't put your purpose behind something that's temporal, right? Like, but I know that inside of this calling that that God has asked me to hold, I know that there are other things about who I am and how I'm made. And I could do those in many environments and in many ways, okay? We are as workmanship created on purpose, Created in Christ Jesus 
for good works. God created you for that purpose. And then finally, God created you with a purpose. Your your creation, your new creation, this, this, this being that you now have become, transferred from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of his beloved son, you have gained citizenship in heaven. You are a saint. God created you with this purpose, and the, and the purpose that God had was prepared, it says, in advance, beforehand, that we should walk in them. So it's not just like, hey, like, I, I got some things I want you to do. You're part of something way bigger. God has a big purpose that that purpose stretches back to eternity past where he has predestined you. He has predestined you to call you his son and his daughter. We intentionally then are playing a role in his grand epic, in his, his grand epic of God's sovereign purposes as they're playing out on this earth. And if you're a Christian, that's true about the, you. You're predestined, meaning you, with, 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 with a purpose. God made you a saint, a citizen of heaven, and you are building God's eternal kingdom. That's what you're doing. So there's a way like we're just doing our life, we're doing the quiet life that that Paul talks about. Sometimes we get to thinking about calling and purpose, and we think about Paul, we think about Peter, think about John, like just not dying, you know, like we think of these big, you know, apostolic callings. But Paul told Christians, he's like, live a quiet life. Just live a quiet life, loving Jesus, loving your family, going to work all day. He, that was Paul's vision for just normal Christianity. But there is no normal Christianity because every, every single boring Christian, all of us together, are building a eternal kingdom. Like that's what's happening. So it's, it's beautiful. It's part of the beauty of the gathered churches that, that we're seeing through this current moment to this day of glory. We're all saints from every tribe and tongue and nation are gathered worshiping the risen Christ. And then Jesus says this to his disciples. When they saw him, they worshiped him. Some of them doubted. Jesus came and said, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. I wonder what that day was like for the disciples to get that great commandment, that, 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 that commissioning from Jesus resurrected because like for so many years the 12 disciples like followed Jesus and they worked and they did what they could do he's like you can do this now yeah, like it, they, they just sort of didn't have clarity on wh- who they were or what they would become you know they thought maybe Jesus was going to hasten in this kingdom and, and, and push out the Romans and And then he kept saying he was going to die, and then he died, and then he rose again. And they're like, in this moment, they obtained the purpose that that Jesus, the creator, before the foundations of the earth, meant to give them. And he gives it to you. And he gives it to me to make disciples, teach disciples people the gospel of Jesus Christ, that he lived a perfect life, he died the death you deserve, and he rose again from the grave to free you and give you this new creation that we're talking about. I love kind of how this passage sits, because in Ephesians, like right before this, in verse 24, he begins with the but God Part, right? Like you're lost in darkness, you're lost in like your sin. Like we were singing that song this morning. And, and I just, every time we sing that song, man, there's a moment where I just, I'm standing face to face with all my sin. And then I just, but God, in his 
love and his mercy in the gospel. But God, being rich in mercy because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you've been saved and raised up with him and seated us with him in heavenly places. You see now the context of your purpose. It's heavenly. You're seated. You're united with the risen, alive Jesus. You're united with him. This is the context of your purpose. For by grace you've been saved through faith that no one may boast. He's like, don't squander grace. Don't treat grace um, haphazardly. For we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. I wish I could just preach this whole chapter right now. But look at chapter 3 if you're in your Bible with me. Look at verse 10. And I think this is really important. And I'll get, I'll get to my end here. This is, this is really important because that's the context of, of how God's created and made you. Okay? But here's something else that's happening right now. It's happening in this moment right now. I want you to see this. Verse 10. So that through the church... The manifold wisdom of God might now be made known to the rulers and authorities in heavenly places. You are Christ's victory lap. The world would not know the majesty and glory of Christ except that he is able to take broken, sinful, destined for hell people and turn them into holy, righteous saints on his mission. That's his triumph over his enemies. And that's part of your purpose and my purpose this morning. I have three concluding thoughts for us. One, I I, I want you to, 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 to lay hold of that verse 310 that through the church. I know this is convenient for me as a pastor, right? Like we find our purpose. We find purpose through the church. We find it through the church that the manifold wisdom of God might be made known. Jesus triumphs over his enemies. And Paul's going to spend a lot of time in the next couple of chapters in Ephesians talking about how the local church is and how your gifts fit into that and how we build the kingdom of God together. He's going to spend a lot of time doing that in Ephesians. You should read it. It's a great book. Read it this week. You you want to see that it's through the church that God builds his kingdom. It's great that there are ministries that are doing amazing things. Christians are doing awesome stuff in business. You, you know, you're serve, I serve my football booster club to the best I can. With the, you, know, you shine a light into that space. That's, those things are all amazing. But it's through the church that his manifold wisdom is made known. And so, so how do you find your place in the church? For us, like one of the things that we just want to encourage you, if you're a member here or you're a tender here, that you would engage this idea of, of growth together. And we've got uh, big posters on the back wall. Go read those, engage on them. There's all kinds of ways for you to do that this fall. You can sign up for uh, form classes. You can sign up for Equip. We had four people sign up day one. Um, you can join a group. Groups are forming, small groups, uh, like gospel community groups, and then discipleship groups where it's just men and women. Uh, there's just lots of ways. We have a prayer night coming up. Um, you can come and pray with our missions team for missions and for our missions partners. There's just a lot of ways. Just get engaged the best you can. Um, next thought, hey, there's resistance. <laughs> I just wish I could just give you such good news today and not tell you how much resistance there is. There's so much resistance to this. And that resistance is coming from inside of you and it's coming from outside of you. Like that's the reality. There's just, there's just a ton of resistance. I witnessed something this week, um, very interesting cultural phenomenon. Maybe some of you did too. There's this new artist that just broke on the scene. He posted a TikTok video of a song, Rich Man, North of Richmond. And the song's about rich politicians. North of Richmond is Washington, if you didn't know that. So it's talking about politicians. 
and no one had ever heard of this guy before. And uh, in fact, like last week, he played at a farmer's market with like 60 people there that were there to buy jam and donuts, right? Like, and this week, 6,000 people showed up. The, the songs had like 8 million hits. The, some producer came to his show this weekend and offered him $8 million to buy his, the, the rights to his music. And like just overnight, this guy just blew up. He spent four hours signing autographs until he drove home to his trailer that he paid $750 for and has a tarp on the roof. But the song, the song and the lyrics, they're really strong, so I'm not even suggesting you go listen to it. I'm not even, I don't even want to talk about the political side of it. I'm sure that some group is going to cancel it and some group is going to like it. But here's what I witnessed today. I witnessed this week a song that is about this very topic. And the idea behind it is that there's this boogeyman, the politician, right? Like that's, 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 that's keeping down the worker, the, the, the average American. Like, it, it, and it struck a chord throughout America. And it, and it did across the political aisles and racial, even like people who wouldn't normally like this type of folk music. Um, and I just watched duet after duet of people from all over the world listening to the words and crying crying because the idea behind it is that, that, that people have dreams and, and people have a sense of destiny and a sense of path and a sense of journey that they're working every single day to, to f- fulfill in their lives this purpose and it just feels like we can't do it. We can't push past this and there's feels like that it's paying taxes or it's losing more than we're gaining or it's like the, it just struck a chord. It, it went across political boundaries. I watched a British man last night crying as he was watching this. He didn't even understand our culture. And it struck a chord. And I think the reason that it struck such a nerve is because we all get this idea that there's a resistance against the pursuit of, of what we want to see in our lives. And you can give up on that. You, you can get to the place where, you're, where you start to look around going, have I given up on that? Have I given up on that? You have a calling, you have a purpose, you have this journey, and it's not good for you to not be on that pass, path. And you do have an enemy. You have forces of darkness that are spiritual, that are always going to stand in your way because Ephesians 3.10 And that darkness has found its way into this physical world through people and systems and all kinds of stuff to push back. But I want to tell you this morning that God has defeated that enemy in Christ. He has defeated that enemy for you. What we're trying to do is stand in that victory and push back against that darkness. That's what we're trying to do. And if you need help doing that, we would love to stand with you. We would love to stand with you. And then finally, my last thing to consider is that God only makes masterpieces. If you know anything about art, our music, you'll know that less than 1% of the most brilliant artist's work is anything close to good. Thousands of paintings, tons of songs, tons of songs in the trash can. God never puts his hand to a canvas and anything comes out that's not a masterpiece. In the 90s, there's a common phrase in a lot of churches, a lot of sermons titled this, I think a book or two, An indie band made a a song about it, God Don't Make No Junk. You ever heard of that? Terrible grammar. But it does mean something for our passage. Its goal is not self-esteem, it's God-esteem. And then through that, self-esteem. 
Does that make sense? It's not, its goal isn't like to puff you up. It's the goal to get your eyes on how great God is and then through God, see how he has made you and is remaking you great. I believe, I should say, I could believe that I'm great. I could believe that I'm great, I'm awesome. But it means something different if Chris thinks I'm great, doesn't it? It goes from ego to maybe this is real. I'm great, it's in my head, maybe it's real. That if he thinks I'm great, but what does it mean when a perfect, great God thinks I'm great? That, that God, brothers and sisters, the perfect God of this world says to you, I made you wonderfully. I made you wonderfully. In breathing my breath into your lungs as a baby, and my breath into your lungs spiritually to save you, I made you for a reason, and I can't wait to show you why. And no matter how old you are, God is saying the very same thing to you today. Come and grow in your purpose and see my predetermined purposes play out in your life and all around you. And the very simple response is, yes, Lord, I do want to grow. That's the simple response this morning. Would you stand with me as I pray? Father, I thank you. Uh, for your word. I thank you for how it shapes us. I, I, I thank you for how it directs us. I thank you for God, like, like um, how it corrects us, how, how your word at times is just a rescue. Like we don't even know. And then you show up and hook us and you settle us down and you sit down with us and you speak to us in a way that you can only do. And so this morning, Lord, I pray um, for that resistance that we might have um, in our lives. Like if it's us that, that, that we're prone to play it, play it small or we've sort of, we've burned out and we've given up or, gosh, I, I just feel like every single one of us is in a very unique spot. And you are able, all powerful, all knowing. You're able to reach each person in this moment in the way that they need. And so, Lord, would you give grace this morning as we worship and as we seek you, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.